Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Dennis Kutatoradze. Dennis earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry at Cornell University, where he worked on developing small molecule inhibitors of signaling proteins in the group of Professor Henning Lin. He subsequently completed his PhD at Harvard in the Jacobson Lab, where he produced a number of significant breakthroughs in asymmetric organocatalysis. Currently, he's a postdoc in the Buckwald Lab at MIT. And from there, I'll hand the floor over to you, Dennis. Thank you very much for joining us to share your work. All right. Well, uh, just to begin, I wanted to thank Matt uh, so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here today to discuss some of the work that I did during the course of my PhD, specifically on the topic of enantioselective organic catalysis. And today I'll tell you a single story that has sort of been published in two parts, the first of which is more of a synthetic paper, and the second is more of a mechanistic investigation of the reaction that we developed. And specifically, I'll talk about what's called the Prin cyclization reaction as catalyzed by combinations of hydrogen chloride and chiral hydrogen bond donors. So I'll be talking about asymmetric catalysis using Bronsted acids, and no doubt we can appreciate the idea of achieving an anti-selectivity through the use of chiral Bronsted acids. And in this scenario, the engenderment of an anti-selectivity comes from the fact that a Bronsted acid can be rendered chiral. Now, the magic happens when the chiral Bronsted acid is able to protonate an electrophile E and activate it as an onium species. And this creates a really special type of intermediate called a chiral ion pair. The chiral anion and activated cation are held in close proximity owing to columbic effects, and this allows for a nucleophilic attack to take place with an antioselectivity. So the first sort of demonstration of this type of catalysis was carried out by the groups of Tirada and Akiyama now around 20 years ago, and uh, these were simultaneous and independently crafted reports. They both discussed the use of chiral phosphoric acids based on the vinyl scaffold that allowed for an antioselective nucleophilic addition to imines, or in this case, aminiums. And now since this important seminal discovery, I would say that there's been a large interest in rendering these types of catalysts even more acidic, such that increasingly less Lewis basic substrates can be activated. So to effectively activate carbonyl-based substrates, and nowadays even alkenes, has required the modification of these types of scaffolds to increase their acidity. And that certainly has been done in a very compelling and exciting way, and as a sort of alternative to rendering the catalyst itself more acidic, our group, the Jacobson Lab, has been focused on the use of cooperative catalysis to control the chemistry of achiral bronsted acids. Now in this type of scheme, you can imagine a very similar means to achieve an antioselectivity, again through that critical chiral ion paired intermediate. But now, the difference is that the chiral anion comes from the hydrogen bond donor recognizing the anion. So in principle, as long as the conjugate base of a Bronsted acid can be recognized through hydrogen bonding, reactions that are catalyzed by these acids can be rendered in antioselective. And I'll just touch on two examples that our lab has published. On the left, a demonstration of the use of a weak benzoic acid to perform a pictet spengler reaction. And on the right, we've found that even strong acids, such as triflic acid and aryl sulfonic acids, can be controlled to enable an antioselective Pavarov type reactions. Now, at the onset of our studies in the Prinz reaction, we were sort of interested in, in extending the chemistry that we had developed with mineral acids to the activation of weakly Lewis basic substrates specifically moving away from imine electrophiles and thinking about activating carbonyls, which of course engage in all sorts of exciting acid-catalyzed chemistry. Now there are a lot of interesting synthetic venues that you can imagine performing this chemistry in, and ultimately the reaction type that we landed on was the so-termed Prinz reaction, or the nucleophilic addition of alkenes to carbonyl compounds is catalyzed by bronsted acids. And it turns out that this type of reaction to form alcohols has indeed been rendered in antioselective and catalytic in the past. And I just want to touch on one example, an impressive report from the labs of Ben List, which I would say constitutes the current state-of-the-art method. But given the high synthetic utility of these types of homolylic alcohol products, we were interested in further contributing to this area of chemistry through the development of a complementary method using chiral hydrogen bond donors to control the chemistry of strong mineral acids. So in the first paper that's referenced up in the top right goes through the uh, sort of optimization efforts that we had in this area, and I won't touch extensively on those results in great detail, but we started with this type of model substrate, these prenylated cell saldehyde-derived compounds underwent cyclization as catalyzed by the combination of chiral hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen chloride, in this case produced in situ through the combination of acetyl chloride and ethanol. Under these conditions, we observed formation of two products, an elimination product, which I'll call E, as well as a chloride trapping product, which I'll call A, typically in a 3 to 1 ratio. 
Now, early on, we had found the, the types of hydrogen bond donors, such as the one pictured on the left, possessing both an aryl pyrrolidine moiety on the left side, as well as a highly substituted pyrrole derived from 1,2-diaminocyclohexane, provided relatively high levels of enantioselectivity for both products and moderate yield right off the bat. Ultimately, we found that this type of catalyst structure, however, was quite prone to two distinct decomposition pathways that led to inferior performance. The first of which is what's known as the Edmund degradation, or the intramolecular addition of ureas and thiureas to amides is catalyzed by strong brown set acids. This had the result of forming a set of catalytically inactive products. Now, a second deactivation mode we found resulted from the parole adding to the activated onium species under the reaction conditions to form bis addicts such as these. And through careful modification of the chiral catalyst scaffold, we were actually able to prevent or at least mitigate both of these effects. Installation of an ethyl ester on the parole led to complete suppression of the bis addition problem, whereas expanding the aryl group on the aryl pyrrolidine side led to an increase in the rate of the productive Prinz reaction such that the Edmund degradation could be effectively outcompeted. So in the end, we were left with a catalyst that provided excellent yield and enantioselectivity for both products in this reaction. Now with this catalyst structure in hand, we were excited to evaluate the substrate scope of this type of reaction. In addition, we found that quenching reactions with KHMDS led to the rapid elimination of the chloride product in situ, providing exclusive access to the alkene product. We found that the reaction was generally tolerant of a number of different types of substitution patterns on the aromatic portion of the salsaldehyde derivative. Both electron-rich and electron-poor substrates provided high levels of enantioselectivity. While we found that the presence of an oxygen atom had a beneficial effect on EE, a DES oxygen analog, as well as a five-membered ring substrate, both reacted to form products in good enantioselectivity. We were excited to find that the method could be extended to affect cyclization reactions of aliphatic substrates, which in almost every case resulted in highly enantio-enriched product, without the need for geminal dye substitution. In addition, we found that sterically congested quaternary stereocenters could be forged in good to high levels of enantioselectivity. And finally, enals were observed to be competent substrates in this type of reaction, providing access to highly enantio-enriched natural product-like molecules. Now, as a result of our optimization efforts and really in evaluating the scope of this reaction, we became aware of a pretty interesting feature, which is that inclusion of a relatively small amount of the optimal hydrogen bond donor catalyst led to a quite substantial rate accelerating effect. In this case, we observed nearly two orders of magnitude of rate acceleration over a process catalyzed by HCl alone. Our initial hypothesis was that the origin of this effect had to do with acidification of hydrogen chloride by the H-bond donor catalyst. Here you can imagine H-bonding to chloride, the conjugate base of HCl, as a means to stabilize that conjugate base and hence render HCl more acidic. This sort of acidification through hydrogen bonding has been well precedented, so we were pretty convinced that this could be happening. Now typically reactions that are catalyzed by Bronsted acids have been shown to obey what's known as the Bronsted catalysis equation, a classic LFER which relates the rate constant of a reaction to the acidity or pKa of the catalyst. Now this relationship has been observed empirically in related phosphoric acid catalyzed reactions, including a Nazarov cyclization developed by Rupings group wherein the strength of the acid and the rate constant for the reaction were found to be positively correlated. So given all this information, you can probably appreciate our surprise when we found that, in our case, it was actually the opposite situation. Ultimately, we found that while the reaction and the presence of the H-bond donor does exhibit a significant rate accelerating effect, the catalyst, in fact, decreases the effective acidity of hydrogen chloride. So let me walk you through some experiments that we did to nail down how this was actually happening. So we were interested in measuring the effect that H-bond donors have on the relative acidity of hydrogen chloride, and we wanted to do this in a reaction medium that was relevant to our catalytic system. So that required us to design a new assay to determine the relative acidity of hydrogen chloride in nonpolar solvents. And here we settled on a UV-vis based colorimetric assay, relying on the photophysical behavior of a carbonyl based indicator, in this case, diferacenal ketone. Now, upon protonation, diferacenal ketone undergoes a substantial bathochromic shift, which you can appreciate from this image here. So we could sort of measure the effect that H-bond donors had on the protonation equilibrium of this indicator as a readout for acidity. 
So as expected, some types of hydrogen bond donors, including this simple diural urea, did provide the expected increase in the relative acidity of HCl as measured by increased protonation of the indicator. However, in contrast, in the same type of titration experiment, we found that the optimal type of H bond donor catalyst in this reaction resulted in a decrease in the relative acidity of HCl. Of course, this was something I had mentioned previously. This was quite enigmatic to us, and we wanted to understand the origin of this effect. So to do so, we performed a series of ground state binding measurements aimed at understanding how HCl and the hydrogen bond donor interact, if at all. Through a job analysis collected through NMR titration studies, we found that indeed the hydrogen chloride and H bond donor associate here in a one-to-one -one ratio. Beyond this, we were able to gain some structural insight into this type of binding interaction through the use of in situ IR studies. Specifically, we found that successive addition of HCl to a solution of hydrogen bond donor catalyst resulted in significant perturbation of only two signals, those corresponding to the amide CO and CN stretching frequencies. Finally, a binding constant of 81 inverse molar was quantified by NMR methods and the proposed one-to-one -one binding event featuring a protonated amide of the hydrogen bond donor could be located computationally. So at this point, we had a compelling rationale for the decreased acidity of hydrogen chloride in the presence of the H bond donor catalyst. Essentially, the Lewis basic amide is effectively able to buffer the acid through protonation with chloride leptin gauge and hydrogen bonding with the thiourea. So coupled with our previous observation about the significant rate acceleration induced by the H bond donor catalyst, this motivated a really important question to us, which was, how is it possible that an H bond donor that makes HCl significantly less acidic still leads to such significant rate acceleration? So to answer this question, we began by performing kinetic studies with the goal of defining the rate law for the reaction so that we could identify the rate limiting step. Consistent with the kinetically relevant binding interaction between hydrogen chloride and the H bond donor catalyst, we observed saturation behavior when plotting the initial rate of the reaction against the concentration of HCl, while keeping the concentrations of all other components fixed. Beyond this, we identified that the reaction exhibits a positive first order dependence on the concentration of H bond donor. Now what you can see here is that we pictured the full rate profile for this reaction as a function of substrate concentration. And what we've done is we've divided the instantaneous rate by the hydrogen bond donor concentration, in this case to the first power. The excellent graphical overlay between each trace, which features a different H bond donor concentration, indicates that the reaction is not only well behaved, but first order in hydrogen bond donor catalyst over its entire reaction course. Finally, we found through the use of initial rates kinetics that the reaction exhibits a positive first order dependence on the substrate concentration, and taken together, these data serve to establish the kinetic relevance of the H bond donor HCl complex that we talked about previously. And we can also now define the stoichiometry of the rate limiting transition state. In this case, the rate limiting transition state features a 1 to 1 to 1 stoichiometry of hydrogen bond donor, HCl, and substrate. So if we were to draw a catalytic cycle for how this reaction could proceed, it actually turns out that all three elementary steps in the cycle proceed with transition states of the same stoichiometry. Now because of this, identifying the rate limiting transition state strictly from the kinetic data is not possible. Protonation, cyclization, and elimination or addition transition states all have the same stoichiometry. So to get at which of these steps actually was rate limiting, we designed a series of competition-based hydrogen deuterium kinetic isotope effect experiments employing isotopically labeled analogs of the model substrate at key positions. So if it turned out that the protonation event in this reaction were the rate limiting step, we would expect to find minimal kinetic isotope effects in all three experiments. In the event that the cyclization event were rate limiting, we should expect to see inverse secondary kinetic isotope effects in both the first and the second experiment owing to the formation of a new CC bond, wherein the hybridization at the reacting carbon atoms are changing from sp2 to sp3. However, we would expect to find the absence of a strong primary kinetic isotope effect in the third green experiment. Now, only in the case where the elimination event were rate limiting, we should observe a primary kinetic isotope in this experiment. So when we perform the experiments and crunch the numbers, we're left with the following figures. We see two secondary inverse kinetic isotope effects in the first two experiments, along with a secondary normal kinetic isotope effect in the third, presumably which arises through hyperconjugative effects. Now taken together, these results are consistent only with the rate-limiting cyclization event. 
Given that this step is rate limiting and sets the two stereocenters in this reaction, it is therefore by definition also an antiodeterminant. So to understand the origins of rate acceleration despite the attenuated acidity of HCl, what we really need to understand is the nature of the transition state that controls the rate of this reaction. That is the transition state that links these two reactive intermediates, the axonium and the tertiary carbocation. Now to do so, we turn our attention to modeling this key step through the use of high-level DFT calculations. We were able to locate energy-minimized transition state structures leading to the formation of the major enantiomer product, the minor enantiomer product, as well as a transition state corresponding to the background reaction catalyzed by HC alone here on the right. Now consistent with our experimental observations, we find that this model is able to recapitulate the observed level of an anti-selectivity in this reaction quite faithfully, and in addition we see that the computations predict a substantial increase in the rate of the reaction as compared to the background process. So at this point, we were really interested in understanding specifically what it is about, in particular, the major transition state that allows for rate acceleration over the background as well as high levels of an anti-selectivity. So specifically thinking about the delta delta G double dagger between these three structures. So in the paper, we have a pretty extensive discussion of what we think is going on. And today, I'll just tell you about my favorite conclusion from those studies that has to do with oriented electric fields. So in dissecting these three transition state structures, we began to notice quite substantial differences in the positioning of chloride with minimal structural differences when thinking about the substrate, which I hope you can appreciate more easily now when we emit the H-bound donor structure for clarity, at least in the first two pictures. So on the left side, in the major transition state, chloride and the activated axonium are positioned anti-periplanar with respect to the alkene nucleophile. Now in contrast, the minor transition state, as well as the background transition state, exhibit chloride and axonium placement that is synperiplanar with respect to the alkene. So we think that these geometric differences in the placement of chloride are actually the primary driver for both the observed rate acceleration over the background reaction, as well as an anti-selectivity. So by virtue of the fact that chloride is negatively charged, we recognize that it exerts an electric field that radiates out from the center of the atom in all directions. And the effect of this field can be felt at different positions, including at both of the reacting carbons in the substrate. Now we can compute the projection of the electric field induced by chloride along the carbon-carbon bond forming axis with the equation that I have pictured in the bottom. And when we do that analysis, what we're left with are the, the following figures. While the applied field is positive in the case of the major transition state, we find two negative values of increasing magnitude when analyzing the minor and the background transition states. So these differences are very important. The positively applied field in the major transition state indicates that chloride here is positioned properly to accelerate the flow of electron density in the productive direction by creating a difference in potential that is aligned with the CC bond forming axis. In contrast, the negative fields in the other two transition states actually indicate that the position of chloride here inhibits the flow of electrons from the alkene to the axonium and consequently raises the energetic barriers to these transition states. So what's interesting here is that when plotting the DFT computed energetic barriers for these transition state structures against the electric fields induced by chloride, we're able to see a correlation between these two parameters. And I'll mention that in the enzymology literature, the observation of such linear correlations between barrier heights and applied electric fields have been taken as evidence for electrostatic catalysis. Essentially, the idea that the electric field that's felt locally within the active site of an enzyme is able to control reaction rates and selectivities. So to summarize, we think that despite the attenuated effective acidity of hydrogen chloride in the presence of the H-bond donor catalyst, the key to success of this reaction has to do with the productive placement of chloride by the H-bond donor catalyst. Optimal placement of chloride in an anti-periplanar geometry with respect to the alkene nucleophile induces a significant boost in the reactivity of the system by aligning the electric field created by chloride along the CC bond forming axis. Alright, so with that, I just want to wrap up by thanking the people in my lab that have been so incredibly instrumental in all of the work that I've talked about today, in particular my PhD advisor Eric Jacobson, who's just been absolutely wonderful, my teammate Corin, who joined me on the second part of this study and has really taken it to incredibly new heights. I'd also like to thank the entire Jacobson lab. Thank you to Matt for having me on the show. I had a blast preparing for this, and I'd like to also thank all of the viewers for tuning in today. 
Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Dennis for a very interesting talk. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.